My name is Michael Victor. I'm working with Ilri as well. And uh, just to continue on, the internet in Ethiopia is not so good. So just to keep things moving, we, we are going to be doing social reporting and tweeting live. So please use hashtags. Everybody who likes to tweet, please go ahead and tweet and use these hashtags. We have hashtag livestock dialogue, hashtag why livestock matter, hashtag gossel2020 and hashtag Africa. So please go ahead and use those. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and just a reminder that uh, we are recording this, uh, both the audio and the video. All the chats that you put into the chat box will be saved. Uh, we'll use the main ones. We're not gonna use people's own chats and everything, but we will use, we use this for collecting ideas and collecting reflections, so we'll use that. And discussions, photos, and other materials may be posted on social media sites. So uh, just remember that anything that's here, it will be uh, open access and accessible later on. Uh, okay, I, the next slide, please. Okay, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Dr. S Saboni Moyo to uh, introduce the session and get us going. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for this opportunity. I would like to uh, welcome everyone again joining my colleagues on behalf of the organizers. We welcome you from across the world to the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock Multi-Stakeholder Partnership. This is the Africa One Regional Meeting. I'm privileged to be your moderator as we start today's meeting. My bandwidth is a bit low, so I might go off video. I don't know if you've seen that, but uh, just to proceed without interruptions. Today is the beginning of uh, Africa One Regional Meeting, which is for English-speaking uh, countries. This will be held over the next two days, and it's held under the theme Lessons from COVID-19 for building back a better future through sustainable livestock. The goal of this year's meeting is to identify COVID-19's impacts and strategize stakeholder responses from across the world to build forward a more sustainable future by addressing challenges and opportunities in the livestock sector. Colleagues, uh, friends, we are delighted to note that uh, we have more than 215 people registered for this meeting. This really demonstrates a high interest, which is an indicator that the livestock sector has a lot to contribute to addressing the challenges brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have in this meeting representatives from government, from research and academia, from the private sector, civil society, farmer organizations, multilateral and regional organizations, as well as investors. This diversity in, in the presence of expertise and organization represents here a wealth of knowledge and experience, which we all look forward to uh, contributing and bringing together to enrich the discussions in these two days. Uh, Vincent, if you could go back to the previous slide, please. At this moment, I would like to uh, present to you the objectives of this uh, regional Africa One meeting. We are here to, uh, in these two days, to present regional impacts of COVID-19 around the four sustainability domains. These domains are uh, food and nutrition security, livelihoods and economic growth, animal health and animal welfare, and climate and resource use. The second reason why we're coming together is to identify options in the short, medium, and long run on how the livestock sector could improve its response through a sustainable livestock approach with solutions from multi-stakeholder uh, groups. So we're delighted that you are able to join us uh, these two days. Uh, next slide, please. Outputs from these regional discussions 
will fit into the global events. And so the chair will uh, touch, the chair of the global agenda will touch a bit more about some of these global events. So what we'll be deliberating on today and tomorrow and these outputs, they will contribute to the global events of uh, 2021, the Gazel uh, multi-stakeholder platform meeting and the 2021 Food Systems Summit. So we'll hear a bit more about that later. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a full agenda ahead of us. Therefore, I will not take much more time uh, from this uh, rich agenda ahead. I would like at this moment to draw your attention to our next session, which is uh, the welcome remarks. Next slide, please. In this session, we will have uh, remarks from four uh, speakers. We are grateful for their time and we look forward to their interventions. Uh, before we start, I would also like to draw attention to everyone who will be contributing throughout this meeting that please stick to the time that has been allocated so that we can end and start our sessions on time. Thank you so much for your attention. At this time, I would like to warmly welcome the chair of the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock, Gazelle. This is uh, Fritz Schneider. Over to you, Fritz. Thank you very much, Bonnie. It's my great pleasure to uh, open this session. It's the second regional meeting we have. We had one in Oceania. And uh, it's great that we have more or about the same number of uh, registrations here as we had in the global meeting a year ago in Kansas. So it shows the enormous interest and uh, makes us very proud and looking forward to this meeting. I'll give you a very short introduction. This will not be long. The Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock is a multi-stakeholder partnership and has been working since 2011 with the goal of promoting sustainable animal production around the world. The SDGs of the UN Agenda 2030, they are actually also uh, posted behind me, built the reference frame for the Global Agenda with its 115 institutional members belonging to all strata of society, the global agenda works towards more sustainability in the livestock sector by facilitating dialogue, assembling science-based evidence, and by advocating practice and policy change. You can find a poster on the global agenda with a bit more information in the share fair of this meeting. Usually, the Global Agenda has a multi-stakeholder partnership meeting once a year to bring together a wide diversity of livestock sector actors to address issues of sustainable development. Of course, this year's meeting, which was initially scheduled for June here in Switzerland, could not take place and has been postponed for one year. Instead, Taking advantage of the virtual world we all live in at, at the moment, a series of regional meetings <clears throat> are being held in eight regions, culminating in a global meeting under the theme Lessons from COVID-19 for Building Back a Better Future Through Sustainable Livestock. Our regional meeting today and tomorrow is an important part of a longer-term process to promote and advocate for sustainable livestock. This meeting will feed into the global meeting in two weeks' time. Results and recommendations from this will inform the 2021 Gasel meeting in Switzerland. And, Who are the participants? And then uh -huh. this results in to promote sustainable livestock within the World Food System Summit taking place in October 2021. I sincerely thank the organizing committee for your highly appreciated work and commitment. Uh, <coughs> the organizers are from Ilri, Shirley Tariwali, Cynthia Mugo, Michael Victor. Then we have Bernard Kimoro, Ministry of Agriculture, Kenya, Martin Barassa from Veterinaires Sans Frontier, Germany, Mohamed Abu Bakar, Federal Ministry of Agriculture, Nigeria, Robin Mbea, Ministry of Agriculture, Kenya, and Simplis Nuala, Fonku, Africa Union Commission. 
I now wish us all a very interesting and fruitful meeting. And I also look forward to seeing you all at our worldwide event from 14 to 18 September. Thank you again and see you very soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fritz, for your opening remarks. Uh, at this moment, we'd like to warmly welcome Jimmy Smith, who is the Director General of the International Livestock Research Institute. Over to you, Jimmy. Thank you, Bunny, and hello, colleagues from across the world. I'm pleased to be part of this virtual regional meeting on lessons from COVID-19 for building back a better future through sustainable livestock. Hillary is pleased to be joining forces with African Union Commission, DRE, the Ministry of Agriculture of Kenya, the Federal Ministry of Agriculture of Nigeria, and VS of Germany. And of course, the global agenda itself. We are pleased to be part of facilitating this meeting on the very important topic and to be able to bring together virtually over 200 individuals from over 31 countries across the world. We've had an interest, a great interest in this from Argentina to Zimbabwe. It is of real importance for us to understand the impacts of COVID-19 on the four sustainable sustainability domains of food and nutrition security, animal health and animal welfare, livelihoods and economic growth, and climate and natural resources, and to discern and pursue solutions that sustainable livestock systems can contribute in this context. Pre-COVID-19, the available evidence point to a large and rapidly growing demand for animal source foods in Africa with a projected increase of over 70% in just two decades, from 2010 to, from 2010 to 2030, due mostly to the continent's increasing population. In 2030, Africa's population is expected to consume 125% more beef, 60% more poultry, 46% more milk, and 77% more eggs than it did in 2010. The African market for animal source foods is estimated to reach $151 billion by 2050. Estimates indicate that under current conditions, a large share of this demand will be, will be met through exports, costly in terms of the drain on the continent's foreign exchange and indeed a missed opportunity for, thousands, for hundreds of millions of Africans who depend on livestock for their livelihoods. The creation of the African wide free trade area offers an unprecedented opportunity to the livestock sector in Africa to reverse these trade flows by meeting internal demands and also for exports. With the right investments and policies, this can be done. COVID-19, a pandemic that has impacted every part of society, not least the livestock sector itself, threatens to disrupt economic and social life for the long term, if not managed well. So this virtual meeting and the global engagement later this month is both very timely and very relevant. Through this forum, we are providing an opportunity for everyone here to share their experiences and lessons in addressing the pandemic challenges through livestock. We are keen to see what innovations and lessons are being learned and how we can share these more widely. I'm therefore very pleased to welcome Minister of Livestock and Fisheries from the Republic of South Sudan, Honorable Oyoti Adego Nayak, the Permanent Secretary from the Ministry of Livestock of Kenya, Honorable Harry Kintai, and from Nigeria, Dr. Dr. Abdul Kader Musa. These three countries with significant livestock industries will make remarks, and I hope through their contributions and this contributions from this conference to these countries and others, we can make a significant impact 
on how the livestock sector is responding to COVID-19. I hope this would be beneficial for all, as it certainly would be for Hillary and for me personally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jimmy, for the uh, welcome remarks. To give us the opening remarks, I'm delighted at this moment to welcome the Principal Secretary to the State Department of Livestock, Minister of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries and Cooperatives in Kenya, Mr. Harry Kimchai. Over to you, sir. Can I check if Mr. Kimta is online? Um, maybe he's yet to connect. While we wait for him, I will move on at this moment and invite for opening remarks, uh, Dr. Abdul Kabir Mwazi, the Permanent Secretary Federal Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development in Nigeria. My audio is letting me down. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, thank you. Over to you. Uh, yeah, I am pleased to join this uh, meeting and to give an opening remarks at the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock, a preparatory meeting Africa One, titled "From Crisis to, to Actions: Lesson from COVID-19." for building a better future through sustainable livestock. Livestock plays a key role in the socioeconomic well-being of Nigerians, aside from providing the much needed animal protein in our diets. The COVID-19 pandemic, which was first reported in the country on the 27th of February 2020, has had huge impacts on the livestock sector in our country. Businesses have been lost, Several animals died of starvation. Uh, prices of animal feed ingredients skyrocketed beyond the reach of feed producers and livestock farmers. Breeding has almost become impossible through natural and artificial insemination due to the non body conformity of animals as a result of hunger. To achieve some of the challenges faced by livestock farmers and solve them, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development carried out priority actions to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria. Uh, specifically, the ministry facilitated access uh, to livestock inputs, such as quality day old chicks, point of lay pullets to replace some of the large numbers hurriedly uh, and prematurely sold due to feed shortages. Ruminant feeds, mineral salt lakes, milking cans, milk cooling tanks, crop residues, crushing machines, forest choppers, pasture processing and transportation equipment were also provided to sustainably support the immediate and long-term needs of livestock farmers. In addition, the federal government through the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development set up a committee to ensure free movement of livestock and livestock products, uh, including ensuring that the abattoirs remain open for meat processing. Similarly, due to the escalating cost of animal feed, the president approved the release of 5,000 metric tons of maize for animal feed, particularly to support the poultry farmers. In Nigeria, the livestock sector shows almost the whole diversity of the sector worldwide, from extensive pastoral nomadic systems the peri-urban, small-scale, semi-intensive mixed-crop livestock farms 
to intensive large scale system, especially monogastric production units. The last stock sector, though growing at a slow pace in our country, has the potential to do better with increased funding, reskilling, and coordination. Despite this, the demand for livestock and livestock products continue to rise, especially milk and meat, uh, and meat, thus making private investment in the livestock sector in our country very promising and potentially very profitable. The critical sustainability factor for livestock industry will require governments and other stakeholders across the continent to take necessary reforms that will address sustainable livestock enterprises across the value chains, create an evolving environment for a more animal-friendly livestock production, transformation, transportation, marketing, and consumption. Farmers must also work in a way that respect the animals, especially their rights, the environment, and the people. In conclusion, sustainable livestock production is anchored around maintaining good breed, health, and nutrition. Efforts should therefore be geared towards good nutrition with attendant positive impact on animal health. While well, appreciating the opportunity uh, to join this meeting, I look forward to making new connections and hearing the feedback from across the continent. I wish the meeting fruitful deliberations and successful outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdul, Abdul Kadir Mwazi uh, from Nigeria for sharing with us the vast livestock resources that your country has and also touching on some of the opportunities and maybe the challenges that uh, need addressing. And we look forward to your engagement and continued sharing of Nigeria's experiences in how you're responding to some of the uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic uh, impact. At this moment, I would like to Welcome, uh, Mr. Harry Kimtai, the Principal Secretary, State Department of Livestock, Minister of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries and Cooperatives are from Kenya. Over to make your opening remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to apologize. I think I was connected. I hope uh, you are hearing me. Yes, I can hear you well. We can also see you, sir. Welcome. Uh, great. I uh, thank you. It's, uh, this technology sometimes can fail us, but uh, we also thank this technology because it has enabled us to meet during these uh, difficult times. Allow me to acknowledge the presence of uh, Fritz Snyder, the Chair of Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock, Dr. Jim Smith, the Director General of the National Livestock Research Institute, best chair in Kenya, my colleague, from Nigeria, Honorable Abdul Kadir Muasa, the Permanent Secretary, Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, distinguished workshop participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I am pleased to join you this afternoon in these very important discussions on lessons learned from COVID-19 for, for building a better future through sustainable livestock. I want to say that indeed, the current situation that we are in is not something that was planned, but I think it happened and it's across the world. And therefore it's important that we engage in this discussion in order to understand and learn uh, lessons that uh, we got from this uh, current situation. And I want to say that uh, here in Kenya, since the first COVID case in Kenya that was reported in March, 2020, we have seen a lot of changes. We have seen a lot of uh, 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 our farmers going through a difficult time, on, especially on unplanned uh, 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 demands. And this is because uh, we saw a reduced demand for livestock products uh, due to closure of most of the restaurants this, and, and hotels. And this was as a result of uh, the government action to contain uh, COVID-19, where everything was uh, closed. We've also seen a reduction in inputs that uh, 
uh, farm inputs that are supposed to be supplied to the farmers. There was also a challenge on cash flows. Uh, there was also restrictions on movement as a result. Goods were not moving freely and this increased the cost of uh, the inputs. In Kenya, we've noticed that uh, we had also challenges of the animal health and the extension services because at one point we needed to understand the situation that we are in and therefore we needed to come up with the protocols so that uh, we can continue with our life. We also saw an increased loss for the hatcheries due to reduced demand for uh, the uh, day old chicks because most of the hatcheries are closed to shop. Uh, we saw uh, a low supply of uh, agro inputs because of uh, lack of uh, 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 trade between uh, countries and where the supplies come from, the life, I mean, the veterinary drugs and other inputs that are really needed in the livestock subsector uh, were, could not be accessed by the farmers. Uh, the closure of international borders and international flights reduced uh, losses of business uh, for agro processors. Uh, this resulted into a disruption of uh, flow of goods, as I've just mentioned earlier. And also our exports uh, were actually uh, stopped, so we could not export to our international markets. The Kenya government, through the State Department for Livestock, uh, placed in place uh, actions to mitigate the effects of this pandemic. This included the following. Number one, what we did as a government and the State Department for Livestock together with the Minister of Health, we developed the protocols and guidelines for interrupted services in the livestock-based food supply chains and uh, handling of foods of animal origin. We reviewed sanitation protocols for slaughterhouses, butcheries, and other sales outlets to facilitate safety and, of, and, and to, have to ensure that there is customer confidence. A post-COVID-19 recovery strategy was put in place that identifies the actions and programs for enhanced recovery and resilience of livestock-based food systems. The proposed programs in the strategy included input subsidies, credit support, development of livestock cold chain systems for SMS, uh, I mean, uh, SMEs. We developed contract farming targeting the imports of animal uh, foodstuffs uh, development of livestock water and marketing infrastructure, livestock disease control systems, amongst others. We have recognized the importance of working with the multi-sector actors right across the sector to address these multiple challenges from the private and public uh, sector that included both the large and small scale development partners. We also engaged other research institutions and academia to come up with other means or proposals that will be able to sustain our strategies. I want also to mention that uh, out of this, we learned a lot of experiences. And what we did was we established what's called a multi-sector platform. Uh, this, we named it Food Security War Room. During this pandemic, that was the very important instrument in coordinating the stakeholders and addressing the emerging challenges uh, promptly. Uh, this, as I said, helped us to, to come up with the protocols within the shortest time possible. Uh, this we also did by identifying the carriers that we need to track and ensure that all the stakeholders, including the government, the private sector, and the development partners, bring all their resources uh, together so that we can surmount the challenges that were ahead of us. The staff from the State Department of Livestock have been engaged in the planning and preparations as committee members and others were participating fully to ensure that there is free flow of food, both from the producers to the consumers. As a result, this enabled us to ensure that there was an interrupted supply. And, and indeed, this really was a very great opportunity to connect in many ways and develop, and we developed new ways that we had not engaged previously with our stakeholders. As a result, uh, there is now very close collaboration between the private sectors and the government in tackling this pandemic. Uh, 
I want to say that uh, this experience really uh, gave the government an opportunity also to come up with the new strategies that will be used in future where we face such kind of disasters. So indeed, it was a really great learning. I mean, this was a learning experience and we learned a lot. Uh, in conclusion, I want to thank the organizers of this event led by the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock for this wonderful and uh, event. And I think it is really good to share globally on each other's uh, challenges and how we manage to surmount these challenges. I wish to say that uh, let's continue contributing to ensure that uh, we have sustainable solutions and share knowledge uh, on issues of livestock production and especially on our livestock systems, knowing that at times there could be some interruptions. More so in Africa, where most of our systems are not yet really fully developed. I therefore want to thank all of you and wish you a good deliberations and let's come up with the solutions that will help the livestock subsector to continue contributing in its sustainable development. Thank you and God bless you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Principal Secretary, for sharing on uh, Kenya's experiences and really uh, touching on some of the concrete activities that the sector is taking. The notes from the presenters will all be uh, shared uh, through the, the, the website and the material, other materials. So please uh, take note and you can follow up to view or read some of the details that the PS had. Thank you, sir. I hope you'll be able to join us through the other sessions. We, we look forward to learn more from uh, what is going on in Kenya. I would like at this moment to thank all the presenters in this uh, session and thank you for sharing and also reminding us um, that what we are deliberating on today and tomorrow will contribute to the global multi-stakeholder uh, partnership meeting from 14 to 18 September. So thank you very much. Uh, th please join me in thanking them in your own space or online where you are. Thank you very much. At this moment, we would like to move on. And uh, the next session is by my colleague, uh, Cynthia Muko who is the Policy and Stakeholder Engagement Advisor at ILRI. She will take us uh, through the overview of this meeting. Uh, thank you, uh, Cynthia, over to you. Thank you, Bonnie. Hello, everyone. It's really good to be here. We have organized for you an agenda that is interactive, engaging, and at, we, that will ensure that we get we dialogue and we get to solutions. So we've started session one, as you've seen, that started with opening remarks from our esteemed guest speakers. We'll also get to listen to four framing presentations of the impact of COVID-19 around four domain areas. Thereafter, we get to excite the exciting part of this today's session, where we will continue the discussions that have been started through the framing presentations in groups. At the end of session one, after we have our reflection and wrap up, we will open the share fair where we will interact and exchange ideas on the work we are all doing related to COVID-19. At this point, we hope to take a very short break. We return to session two, where in addition to participating more in the share fair, we will have an engaging conversation to be set up by an exciting group of panelists. Um, session two, uh, session three, day two, is all about finding solutions and co-creating actions on how the livestock sector can contribute to building back better. I hope you're all ready for three very engaging sessions that will generate a lot of information. Next slide, please. So Dr. Boni earlier mentioned that we got a lot of interest. We got around 215 participants who registered they were from 32 countries, 16 in Africa, uh, uh, Anglophone Africa. And also to note that it's truly a multi-stakeholder meeting. 
We have representations from private sector, public sector, academia, civil society, development partners. So we are expecting a very, very rich conversation. So to get right into session one, we have already kicked off, which is the next slide, please. We, we've kicked it off with our welcoming, our objectives our, and, and our, uh, our, uh, our presentations from the speakers. So we are getting right into the framing presentations next. Then we'll do some group discussion, reflection, and we take a break as we view the share fair posters. So the framing presentation, which is coming next, will be moderated by Dr. Simplice Nawala, who is the head of agriculture and food security at the Africa Union Commission. Dr. Nawala uh, oversees the implementation of AU decisions on Africa on agricultural growth and transformation. Simplice, over to you, please. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. Thank you, Cynthia. I'm trying to switch on uh, my uh, video. Thank you very much, Cynthia, and uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this second part of the first session of our virtual meeting. Uh, this second part of our sessions will basically deal with the lessons that we have learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and this will be done around the four sustainable livestock sector domains. Just to recall these domains, we have food security, livelihood and economic growth, animal health and welfare, and finally climate and natural resource use. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. David Harvey. David is the program manager Director for Land All Lakes Venture 37, providing management and technical oversight to several projects in Africa and the Caucasus. Dave uh, joined uh, V37 in November 24, and he has over 25 years experience of livelihood development across the moral value chain in Africa. Dave is still actively involved in his farm in northern Zambia, where he had Jesses to supply the district town. So Jess, you are welcome for sharing with us the impact of COVID-19 on food security. Dave, over to you. Good, uh, good afternoon, good morning, um, everybody. This is uh, Dai Harvey, and uh, my Seni wants it to my uh, Zambian colleagues that I hear and can see uh, on on the screen, um, and are are talking to us. Um, could um, could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, COVID nineteen continues to disrupt many countries around the world. Um, and the food security and livelihoods of many people are, are at risk. Prior to COVID-19, approximately a third of the world's population were not getting the correct balance of nutrition. And because of the pandemic, the UN reports that an additional 130 million people will fall into the status of food insecurity due to the pandemic. This is truly a very worrying situation. Access to, sustain, to sustainably produced, affordable, safe, and nutritious sourced foods, meat, dairy, and eggs, is critical to reducing stunting and adequately feeding rural and urban communities and maintaining economic and environmental st stability. However, based on a pulse survey that was conducted by Venture 37 in Rwanda, Mozambique, Georgia, and Bangladesh, a cross section across parts of the world, of less developed parts of the world during um, July of 2020, we found that due to the pandemic, consumption and animal source foods had approximately fallen by 37%. Development organizations, agribusiness, private sector partners must adapt to COVID-19's disruption by building back a more resilient and inclusive livestock food system to cost effectively supply these nutrient dense foods to the poorer communities. As communities recover, we need to work out the best way and the most leveraged way to develop and support these markets that have been disrupted 
to ensure that nutri nutritionally dense food is more accessibly more accessible for marginalized food compared to where where it was before the COVID situation. As global leaders in sustainable livestock production and animal sourced food programming, Land O'Lakes Venture 37 and our partner, our partners, including ILRI, look across market systems to try to find solution. Um, part of my presentation will be to, sh to show some of those possible solutions and some of the ways that there are opportunities going forward by no means saying that these are the only solutions, but giving some examples of that. Lando Lakes, as you know, Lando Lakes Inc., um, our major collaborator is a $15 billion agribusiness with diverse agro-businesses, technologies and insights in animal nutrition, crop inputs, dairy, data analytics, and sustainability. Paired this with nearly 40 years of agricultural development um, in Land O'Lakes Venture 37, we have a powerful toolkit for creating customized solutions for livestock food systems across the world. A good, I'm going to give you a few examples, um, which I hope we'll be able to dig into a little later on, um, and I'm very happy to, to, to respond to them. In Rwanda, we've had a, a, a good example where poultry production, um, there's been major, major pressure on the poultry production, and the egg, particularly around egg production. Um, it, with this, there was a response by uh, USAID in the Feed the Future Rohara Rohazi program and activity, Ministry of Agriculture through the, through the government of Rwanda, and uh, supported by Rwanda's National Early Childhood Development Program, who targeted, across, targeted children across the country um, to ensure that they had access to eggs. Numerous children and households received 21 egg pro producers benefiting from this activity, ensuring that, uh, that, that, that eggs were available to, to people on the ground and to poor households on the ground. Similarly, other efforts uh, uh, with uh, Venture 37 working alongside um, ILRI and the area of Africa Dairy Genetic Gains, um, ensuring that uh, the genetic makeup of animal of dairy animals in Tanzania and Ethiopia, with over um, 200,000 farmers being touched in all of those areas to ensure that there is adequate milk being produced in, 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 uh, in Tanzania and, and Ethiopia and allowing farmers better access to milk uh, and, and dairy products. In addition, we understand that different, that different agricultural value chains are not siloed and we believe that it's very important that there is an integration between crops and livestock and the market systems in order to build true resiliency and mitigate against the devastating effects of climate change and protect animal source foods. In such instances it's very important to involve and engage private sector and this is, this is to allow for sustainability and also to take the burden off host country governments that have many other aspects. Such a, such a, such a partnership is another simple partnership that is, that is currently underway in Kenya, which is uh, covering and, and focusing on, focusing on crop production. Um, uh, next slide, please. Hello. Next slide, please. Uh, the in st existing structures and challenges are being exacerbated by COVID-19, making food security an immediate concern and impacts are being felt through the food system along the value chain from producers to intermediaries and to consumers. The necessary global response to the pandemic has, been, has led to severe disruptions in availability of inputs and extension support, fractured input, fractured input and output supply chains, closed marketplaces and reduced in incomes. As a, result of the, as a result, the WFP estimates that the number of people who will be actually hungry, mostly in Africa, 
will double this year, and the World Bank forecast agricultural production in sub-Saharan Africa will fall by 3 to 7%. In this graphic, you will see illustrated the dairy value chain in East Africa. We know that the dairy industry has an important role to play in feeding Africa's growing population, reducing chronic malnutrition and the effects of the con that affects the continent. However, COVID-19 has a number of negative impacts on African dairy sector, including uh, lack of movement of people and goods um, within and, and across borders. The da dairy processes um, in particular can provide a strategic uh, resource to allow smallholders to connect to markets and al allow them to improve their livelihoods and also improve access to access to, uh, to, to animal source foods. There's also been a significant loss in purchasing power due to lack of jobs. We've already heard um, from the PSs in both countries about the, the challenges around uh, the closing of hospitality industries, um, and that has also allowed, has reduced livelihoods. Though these challenges exist, dairy in particular is an attractive and impactful investment for COVID-19 response and recovery, helping the region to build back better for a more sustainable and nutritional food system. Dairy products are not only often the sole source of specific micro and macronutrients, building back immune systems such as B12, vitamin A, calcium, et cetera, but dairy production also contributes to a more reliable source of year-round income compared to high-risk rain-fed agriculture. As dairy is local, it is both good for the consumer and the producer. Farmers are able to get their milk to market and the consumers have access to affordable dairy products. This creates an opportunity for near-term, continuous nutrient-frequent response to the pandemic. What's more, there is a significant private sector interest in investment and engagement, particularly in support of a sustainable dairy, dairy value chain. What is our response to this? And what do we suggest is our response? Farmers, if possible, need to invest now to continue to increase production for the future, um, realizing um, and knowing that cows have medium to are biological and have uh, nine months to produce a calf. So it is very important to keep, to keep the farmers moving ahead and being able to have access to ensure that their cows are bred. It's important also to ensure the continued operation of markets, both formal uh, markets and the informal that are, that are ac able to access uh, uh, poorer households. It's also important to ensure that the affordable products getting to consumers, that they are safe and, and nutritious. Um, while most of the consumption of dairy products across the region is through informal markets, there is a significant opportunity of farmer allied intermediaries in supporting commercially orientated farmers in, pro in production of their livelihoods. It's also important to ensure that many of the poorer consumers that we know are visiting um, markets on a daily basis continue to have safe access to these, to these products. Uh, next slide, please. Next, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so, Dairy, the Dairy Nourishes Africa initiative is a unique long-term pu public-private partnership which seeks a holistic transformation of the dairy industry throughout East Africa. However, Dairy Nutrition Nourishes Africa is more than a singular private sector engagement. It is a movement that will crowd in a broad-based support for sectorial transformation. Dairy Nourishes Africa provides sustainable front and center, advancing climate smart farm management and increasing enterprise efficiency using environmentally friendly solutions to reach out to consumers and effectively reducing dairy's footprint while simultaneously building a more resilient food system. Throughout a holistic effort to foster and support activities through the dairy ecosystem. Dairy Nourishes Africa takes an enterprise-centric and government-aligned approach to growing consumer demand, driving dairy enterprises to their full potential while increasing farm production and also 
creating a supportive and interconnected operating environment in which dairy industry can survive. The dairy... No, finish up. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. So 21% of sub-Saharan Africa population is under you, undernourished, but the provision of animal source foods are an important intervention and ensure the growth and development of both young children in physically and co cognitively. COVID-19 will exacerbate these challenges and the private and public sector must work together to find new solutions and sustainable ways to reach children and ensure that they're receiving nutrition rich animal source foods, especially during these challenging times. Milk is one of these ways. We, we, we look forward to discussing more about this um, in our sessions below, but we feel that school milk feeding programs are one of the solutions to, to, to this and a way of in, ensuring that, folk, that people, that young children have access to uh, nutriently dense uh, products. Next slide, and thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dave, for this uh, excellent presentation on the impact of COVID-19 on the food security. What we can take as a message here is that it's worrying to, to, to learn that an additional 130 million people will fall into food uh, insecurity. And more worrying is the fall of 37% uh, in the consumption of animal uh, source food. But the, the good news is that there are solutions. And the way forward, as you have mentioned, is to work towards building a more resilient food system that will entail working on integration of value chains, looking at crop livestock integration, uh, support availability to food of quality food and quality input. And this is a good processing that would mean value addition, food safety issues, and more importantly, strengthen the partnership, the public-private partnership. Thank you very much, Dave. The second speaker who will deal with the impact of COVID-19 on livestock and livelihood is Mrs. Uh, Elizabeth Fry. Mrs. Elizabeth is the founder of the AQM, Greater Company Limited, dealing with integrated poultry business, managing three breeders' farm, a archery, and a feed mill. She's the member of the African Agribusiness Academy, African Women in Agribusiness, and a member of the Professional Poultry Association, feed mill, etc., in Tanzania. Elizabeth, you have the floor. Um. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I will uh, uh, quickly um, go through my presentation, but prior to that, I would like to thank you, the organizing uh, committee of uh, this um, uh, important meeting. So straight away, I would like to go to my presentation. Um, I... I think I, in Tanzania, the case is a bit uh, different, uh, even though the fear uh, was there. The effect of that fear was on everybody. So uh, even, the, even though the government did not fully uh, lock down, but um, the, the population locked themselves down. And uh, that was... Uh, uh, a fear that um, I'm going to uh, share with you the impact of that fear, but as well as the uh, um, uh, indirect uh, um, challenges that were caused by uh, a lot of challenges, uh, especially on our, on our poultry sector and livestock livestock sector. Uh, one of the of the big challenge that I'm looking at is the disruption of our food systems. 
And uh, as you, you all know that uh, the, the food systems are, are being um, contributed by a small and medium uh, sized company who are also working with the smallholder farmers to uh, at least allow that, uh, uh, those systems to function. Um, due to COVID-19, even the farmers, the smallholder farmers were, were afraid uh, for the case of Tanzania, um, the, the COVID-19 hit um, the, the major cities like Dar es Salaam, and um, uh, there was a concern from the farmers that um, um, the people from Dar es Salaam should uh, not be um, allowed to travel to the, to the rural areas. My company uh, works with the rural, rural, pe rural farmers we are working with uh, more than 616 smallholder farmers and 420 franchises. And this was a challenge because everything that we are producing from the, um, from the day, day old chicks, from the feeds, from the, um, the extension services we had invested for the past uh, many years um, came to a halt. Now, um, due to that fear, um, as you know, poultry is one of the um, um, the products from poultry are the are the are the major um, um, products that are, are are used for nutrition and for even normal you know good protein that is recommended uh, health wise. Now uh, that was purely uh, disrupted, but also the grains from the smallholder farmers. And with the uh, policy that was going on in Tanzania uh, with the export of uh, grains also affected the, the production of chicks and also the rearing, cost, the rearing um, feeding of the poultry, uh, poultry and other livestock. Now, when you're looking at the financial um, and the financial uh, impacts, most of the banks were, were afraid um, and they were not able to give... Um, their decisions whether or not they should continue with investments and also uh, issuing loans and uh, because of the uh, uncertainty of whether or whether the, 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 the companies will be able to repay the loans. That was another challenge. Now, um, looking at um, the solutions for this, uh, as a company, we immediately thought that uh, digital agriculture should be the only way to communicate with the farmers and also uh, to look at um, issues of financial, financial um, support to the smallholder farmers. And also we introduced uh, something we call uh, mobile extension services, information sharing through um, uh, social media, and uh, of course, training uh, and uh, database development and also related programs like uh, production programs. We, we, we started as a company to invest on digital agriculture. At the moment, we, we, we have already invested on call center and of course, mobile, mobile services and the use of 100% of uh, social media. Um, the other issue that we, we've been engaged with the, with the government um, seriously in, uh, is the issue of policy reviews and budgetary concerns. Um, we've suggested to uh, government a number of innovations and good uh, practices and policy because we feel like uh, the business environment, even with COVID, was not so supportive to, um, to companies. Um, now, uh, it was crucial that uh, a business environment should be looked at, especially um, on, uh, on uh, taxes, on um, financial loans, credit facilities, pharma, pharma finances, and all those. So those were the major, major, major challenges. They still are a challenge. So let's go to the second slide, please. I tried to give um, some statistics um, from, from my company, um, just for others to learn exactly what we went through through uh, COVID-19. Sales dropped. We were, we were uh, selling at least uh, USD $160,000 a month. And for the first month of COVID, the sales dropped to $25,000 a month. 
they, we tried to go to a bank and we, we accessed um, about $100,000 at 24% interest. And that was the high interest during COVID. So that, that left the company with a, with, with a, with a, with a very um, big burden. Uh, employment, well, we had uh, 120 staff. Out of 120 staff, we had about 46 uh, veterinary uh, doctors who were working with smallholder farmers. We had to drop that number to 64 and invested in digital communication and mobile veterinary service. That was another another way of uh, mitigating the, the drop of uh, uh, extension services to reach out to the rural farmers. We had um, uh, uh, 420 franchises. The uh, franchises dropped up to 188. So we, we had to invest in reviving the rural-based franchises. These franchises are the franchises that kept the chickens for four weeks. Um, the chicks were vaccinated. They received all the, the first uh, treatment before they reached to other um, smallholder farmers. And each franchise was, was supposed to reach at least 500 households. So once the franchises were affected, that means the, 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 the smallholder farmers affect, were affected too. So we had about 614,000. We ended up with 5,000 smallholder farmers. Now we are working on reviving customer base. And the price for one chick, the, during uh, January and February, we tried to lower the price and we could not... Um, we could not sell at all. So we had to give away all the production of chicks. And uh, the, the, the chicks that we were giving away a month was about 256,000 chicks. But we did, not e even, we did not even know how we could monitor at um, a smallholder farmers. That um, to date, we don't have the data for mortalities and uh, we, we don't have the data for vac vaccination programs, whether the farmers were, were able to vaccinate. And um, in February, we decided to not hatch the chicks. We decided because our, 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 our parent stock farms, they were new parent stock farms with almost 30,000 parents. So in February, we had to give away eggs, which are very expensive. We had to feed the, the parent stocks, we had to give away um, eggs to the, to the COVID centers um, in Tanzania. So as you can see, we went into complete loss. At, at the same time, we were, um, we were um, having um, a burden on feeding the parent stock, at least to revive those parent mm -hmm. stock. But uh, even though we lost a, a, you know, a, a good amount of our parent stock in one of our farms. So um, we had a new investment uh, that was going on. It was a new animal feed mill construction. So the expatriates from China were locked down in China. So to date, this project was supposed to be done in four months, but this project took a year before we, um, we finalized the construction. But to date, the, 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 the plant has not been commissioned to us. And we had a foreign expert who was on training uh, on a nutrition, poultry nutrition in Nairobi, and uh, he had to fly back to um, Cameroon for, for leave, and he was held in Cameroon for more than four months. That means all the salaries and all the cost of his employment was on Aiken Glitters. At the end of uh, March or mid-March, he decided to resign just because he did not want to put uh, the company into more losses. Um, uh, second slide, please. Like Can we go to another slide? Yeah, okay. Um, we, we, we also um, are facing to date, we have paid for new uh, parent stock from India, but to date, we've not been able to bring in parent stock because of lockdowns and flight cancellations, even after the opening of the lockdowns. So um, as you can see, um, other poultry companies in Tanzania, um, they did not even have parent stock. So chick scarcity was a problem. Um, during COVID, it was almost 40%. Um, and importation of parent stock to date. I have paid about uh, $91,000 to import uh, parent stocks. But to date, I'm told the, the plane has been delayed for 14 hours. 
as I'm speaking, I'm, I'm, I'm in fear uh, that uh, probably the parent stock will not be able to come to Tanzania. When you're looking at policy um, uh, issues, AKM Glitters has been requested by the government to invest on grandparent stock, um, and which we, we, we don't know how to do this because um, we, we, uh, why they, they suggested that we should at least invest on grandparent stock, it's because during COVID or whether COVID will come again or in the future, we should not be facing the challenges we are facing now. But as you can, you can see, uh, having a grandparents, uh, parents, uh, investment on grandparents, is, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of uh, investment. It needs research. It needs um, a lot of um, research and product development. It needs partners into this. And that is a, is a challenge for the, for the growing company. When you're talking about a financial, financial, sorry, we need to finish up. Yeah, um, like as you can see, there's a lot of challenges. Now, uh, these two templates, of course, covers everything that comes in in other ta tax, uh, uh, other other challenges because all of them are summed up in this uh, whatever. So taxes are still the same, uh, salaries are still the same cost, nothing, donor, donor funds were delayed. Can we go to another uh, uh, template, please? That was in those templates. Control, you know, everything that you see is in the, in the, in the summing up of the second uh, and first. Yeah, let's go another, another, another slide. Yeah, so when you are talking about salaries, this uh, salary cost remains the same. So AKM Glitters came up with contingency plan. We had to invest on call center, which is working very well with us. We are communicating with farmers. We are training the farmers. And we are also using social media to train the farmers to communicate with the farmers. And uh, we are trying now to uh, revive, um, revive the, the rural-based uh, uh, um, customers. And also we have invested in a mobile vehicle, like a mobile vehicle with a few staff controlled ones with all gadgets um, um, to, to reach the farmers so that the farmers are protected and our, our staff are protected. And uh, we, are, we are now establishing an IT for, um, platform. I think it will start to work in, uh, in, um, in, in October. Uh, this will allow us to train the farmers through the platform and the farmers will be receiving the you know, trainings, materials through their phones. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. Yeah, please so, finish up, Elizabeth. Can we please finish it up. Sorry. Yeah. So, as you can see, everything that I've been talking about on our last uh, um, slide as solutions, I've already spoken about those. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth, for this uh, presentation. I think as a takeaway message, uh, we we can. Note that the COVID-19 has impacted on the productive capacity of uh, the farmers and the, uh, the, the, the business people in livestock. This has impacted also on your income. It has impacted on the job. We have lost a lot of job due to this. And as a solution, you are proposing more investment in digital agriculture, you are proposing the financial stimulus packages as well as policy review in order to strengthen the resilience or the livelihood of livestock keepers or the livestock uh, business people. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, for the presentation on the impact on COVID-19 on animal health and welfare, we will have two speakers. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Jean-Philippe Dopp, who is the Deputy Director General at the World Organization for Animal Health, commonly known as OIE. He is in charge of institu international or institutional affairs and regional activities. Before joining the OIE, he worked with the Ministry French Minister of Agriculture, Agri-Food, and Forestry. After this presentation, we will have a short input that will give an African perspective, and this will be done by Dr. Samuel Wakusama, who is uh, 
the regional representative of OIE for Eastern and the Horn of Africa. So, Dr. Dob, you have the floor, and Samuel will immediately take after you. Over you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nuala. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone, and thank you uh, for uh, the opportunity to uh, provide inputs. I, I will try by uh, reminding uh, what are uh, zoonotic threats and emerging diseases. Uh, in fact, we, we, we already knew before COVID-19 that 75% uh, of emerging infectious diseases of humans are zoonotic. Uh, so this is not an exception. Uh, this virus is a zoonotic virus. Uh, and we, we know that uh, these zoonotic threats are, um, are facilitated by uh, globalization, uh, movements of good and people, permanent changes regarding climate, climate human behavior, deforestation, urbanization. So there are many opportunities for pathogens to colonize new uh, territories and uh, a huge interdependence of countries uh, for their own protection. Uh, and is the reason why we like at the OIE, but also uh, with our colleagues of uh, WHO uh, or, or, or FAO, we like to, work, to speak of one world and one health because all is related, uh, all is connected, connected between animal health, human health, and uh, environment health. Next slide, please. So uh, this slide uh, illustrates the zoonotic origin of coronaviruses. Uh, COVID-19 is not the first one. We already knew uh, SARS, coronavirus, uh, Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome, coronavirus. And we know that uh, uh, these uh, viruses uh, circulate in animals, uh, most of the time in bats, but could be also in, in camels. Um, in, in this particular case of uh, COVID-19, uh, there is an hypothesis of spillover between uh, different species, uh, which has to be still uh, investigated, and uh, some expert missions are going on, uh, in particular in China, to uh, have a better uh, knowledge of, of that. Next slide, please. So we, we had a, a great demonstration with the, the last speakers of the huge impact of uh, this, uh, this pandemic. Uh, here you have uh, some, uh, some figures of the last events. Uh, for sure, Ebola was already concerned, um, Africa was already concerned by Ebola. Uh, there is an estimation here that uh, the impact uh, could be uh, more than uh, $10 billion. But uh, when it comes to COVID-19, we reach figures that uh, we, we never knew before. Uh, Elizabeth Christopher, I think, described very well, uh, as well as uh, uh, David Harvey, the huge impact it has on uh, the activity uh, on the food chain, on private companies, um, the, the need to uh, all reorganize and according to calculations by UN and others, we estimate that the COVID-19 pandemic could cost more than uh, $15 trillion. Uh, this, is, uh, this is tremendous, and uh, uh, we, we have to, uh, to invest uh, in, in order to avoid uh, so huge impact. We have to invest in predicting this phenomenon, invest in, in prevention, and invest in, in controlling uh, these uh, events. Next slide, please. So these are uh, some examples of the work uh, we developed at the OIE. Uh, we had already a wildlife working group. We issued some statement to remind the importance of, uh, of regulation of uh, wildlife uh, trade. Uh, we set up some uh, ad hoc groups which uh, issued uh, some uh, guidance uh, for veterinary laborator laboratory to support uh, human health testing, and I know that, uh, for example, the PANVAC laboratory uh, in Ethiopia uh, used this guidance and uh, uh, provided some uh, important support uh, to uh, test COVID-19, and also in many other countries. We also issued consideration for uh, sampling animals, and I will uh, 
show you uh, some uh, results of these uh, samples. And uh, we, we try to uh, explain how to uh, manage uh, COVID-19 risk assessment and in order, in order to avoid uh, international trade disrupt, disruption. And we issued uh, an important paper uh, regarding that. Next slide. So here is the example of the statement that uh, our working uh, group issued for wildlife. Uh, many considerations are still to be uh, considered. We will uh, work on, uh, on a guidance document to, to see how to better uh, regulate uh, this trade, in particular the trade of live animals within uh, wet markets. So uh, we, we are not against uh, this, uh, this trade, uh, which is very important for uh, uh, many communities in Africa, but uh, we know that it has to be better uh, regulated, uh, risk have to be better assessed, uh, agent inspection uh, have to be improved, and uh, we will continue to work on, on that. Next slide, please. So, uh, yes, uh, we know that these emerging diseases from animal sources can have severe economic and health impacts. We, we can go uh, fast on this disease. Disease spread between wildlife, livestock, and humans occur through complex transmission. We call this the, the spillover, and we have still to investigate on it. Next. Uh, the risk of disease emergence has in increased uh, as a result of uh, opportunities, uh, globalization, deforestation, and so on. Next. And uh, this is exacerbated by human activities. So uh, livestock production, intensified livestock production could be challenged. But uh, in that case, uh, we know that uh, the issue uh, is more uh, wildlife uh, regulation than uh, livestock uh, regulation. Next slide, please. We also learned from uh, some uh, African uh, project, uh, in particular from the Ebo sur Sea project we have in, uh, in Central Africa. Uh, it is a project uh, funded by the uh, European Union and uh, which, which had uh, good results in terms of uh, surveillance of Ebola viruses, hemorrhagic fevers, in terms of uh, collaboration between uh, human health and uh, animal health. And uh, with improving the capacity of uh, the laboratories of the region to detect Ebola, uh, we also improved their capacity to detect uh, COVID-19. And uh, it was really uh, nice to see uh, how these labs, uh, which benefited from uh, the Ebola sur Sea project, uh, are all, all today able to test COVID-19. Next slide, please. So here are uh, some uh, results of uh, our uh, the testing campaigns of the country of the, our members regarding animals. Uh, we could fear that uh, the, the virus could disseminate in, in many animals and uh, uh, not only wildlife but also uh, breeding animals. And and you see that in fact uh, we had. Uh, no extension of uh, this diffusion. We had some cases in cats, in dogs, in tiger, neon, more felines. The puma was uh, recently uh, identified in South Africa. And the, the only, uh, let's say, breeding animals uh, which were identified in farms uh, were mixed in, in the Netherlands. And uh, this uh, event is still under investigation to know if uh, uh, we face a, a human to mix uh, contamination or uh, on the other sense, it could be possible for mix to uh, contaminate humans, but we, we have still to assess uh, the, the risk. Next slide. Here is a, an important communication from uh, uh, UC Davis University showing that uh, the level of uh, susceptibility uh, could be uh, different uh, in different species. But uh, according to uh, the presence of some receptors, which are able to, uh, uh, to receive the, the virus, uh, researchers uh, determine the level of risk 
of uh, susceptibility. And you see finally that uh, breeding animals and livestock are not uh, the first concern, but we could face uh, some concern for uh, non-human mammals. Next slide, please. Uh, Jean-Philippe, please to uh, finish up yes. as well. So to yes, so this leads to a principle of action. Uh, we must control zoonotic pathogens at the animal source, and we must embrace the one health approach uh, onboarding altogether uh, human health and animal health and environment health. Next. Next, please. So these are uh, crucial cornerstones. Our, our objective within uh, OIE is to develop uh, standards to uh, improve the capacity of, of countries uh, to deliver uh, the capacity of surveillance, control, and prevention. Uh, we have also uh, at uh, WHO the importance of uh, uh, the international health regulation. And together, we try to develop the national capacities for early detection and rapid response, investing in our animal health and human health uh, uh, sectors is really uh, an important cornerstone. Next slide. So which lessons for the future? Uh, there is a need for strengthening the One Health approach. Uh, because the health of animals, humans, and environment are inextricably linked. Uh, we show that disease spillovers events uh, can have uh, huge uh, consequences, and this risk is uh, increasing and cannot be ignored. There is a need for collective action and international cooperation, uh, because disease know no borders, so cooperation doesn't need to face borders. And the drivers of disease emergence are broad, and no one organization, uh, no the OIE alone, no WHO alone, no FAO alone, no UNEP alone can have an impact across all of them. And there is a need of strong political awareness and commitment. And uh, I was very happy to see uh, ministers today, ministers from Kenya, Nigeria, to be there, uh, to sustain investments and capacity buildings of national and regional health systems to sustain research and scientific knowledge, and to support multilateral dialogue and engagement in global and regional organizations. And, and thank you to, to Gazel and, and Ilri uh, to, to promote that. And perhaps now a few words from uh, my colleague based in Nairobi uh, to give you uh, how uh, we deal with that in the African context. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, participants. Uh, 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 John Dope has said most of the, the things, but uh, at least from the African perspective, it's very important to invest in capacity building, especially for the One Health approach. Uh, some of the labs, like the one he mentioned in Ethiopia, the National Animal Health Diagnostic Center, has been able to actually achieve this through the twinning program that we have had with the OIE with them, and uh, it will be nice for the most of the African institutions to actually participate in such programs to be able to provide the capacities, both human and uh, human capacities and physical capacity. With regard to collective and international cooperation, I'm glad to see the African Union and the Africa CDC uh, actually conducting sessions to actually create awareness. And uh, I, I think they, they, they are playing a, a very major leading role to connect the political, to mobilize and uh, mobilize resources and the political will for technical uh, support funding for the member countries. It is important that the political will is there for the long standing and sustainable One Health collaboration into the government structure. Because most of the time, this One Health uh, approach is not really very well anchored in the ministries. But from the African perspective, it would be very good if we had a very well sustained structure and long standing, such that the countries, uh, such that such events when they come up, it's easier to approach and tackle it from one angle. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sama. Thank you very much, uh, Jean Philippe, for your presentation that have refreshed our mind on the origin of, of the virus and uh, the level of its susceptibility and the risk. 
thank you for the information on the, the, the global loss uh, that the COVID-19 could lead to, that is about over 15 trillion US dollars. And for the solution that you are proposing and uh, about monitoring, surveillance and control, we need, this needs to be strengthened and this needs to be done around the one health approach. And for this to happen, we need political will. So we need to create more political awareness and get commitment from our policy makers. And more importantly, and again, this has been said by previous speakers, we need to strengthen collaboration, partnership, and international cooperation. Our last speaker will share with us the impact of uh, the pandemic on climate change and natural resource use. The speaker is Sonja Legner. She's a soil science ecologist and biologist working with uh, AOE, the International Livestock Research Institute. So I'm going to have the floor. Thank you very much, Simplice. Can you please confirm if you can hear me well? I can hear you very well. I hope okay. others are doing the same. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you very much. I will give the last framing presentation for today and I will speak about the impact of the livestock sector, the pandemic on climate change and natural resource use in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have just heard uh, a little bit about animal health and uh, you all know that livestock uh, is also playing a role in uh, pandis, uh, in disease transmission. So there's also a lot of focus now during this COVID-19 pandemic on livestock. And um, we also know that there is a lot of interaction between livestock and wildlife. But there are a lot of other adverse effects of livestock on the environment. And they can have secondary effects on disease development and spreading. So I would like to talk about them um, a little bit now. So, of course, the, probably one of the biggest um, the ones that we have to address here is the impact of livestock to climate change. We all know that livestock is an emitter of greenhouse gas emissions. Approximately 15% of global greenhouse gases originate from livestock if you follow life cycle assessment approaches. And the main sources of these greenhouse gas emissions are enteric fermentation, that is the ruminant digestion that produces methane, animal manure, and deforestation and land degradation. And then there's also a little bit of transport and processing, but this usually doesn't um, have a big contribution in sub-Saharan Africa. We do, however, know that livestock greenhouse gas emissions can dominate national greenhouse gas budgets in many sub-Saharan African countries. Of course, there's also an effect of climate change on livestock. And this figure shows all the different effects that climate change via increase of temperature and precipitation variation, for example, can have on livestock. And to pick out just a few, uh, we have heat, droughts, floods that can occur more frequently and become more severe, uh, change in vegetation, which can affect the nutritional quality of the vegetation for the livestock, and also higher disease pressure, because we know that certain vectors can invade new territories and new diseases can start spreading. And of course, there are also a lot of feedback loops between all these points. For example, uh, weak animals that are already stressed by heat and drought or lack of fodder can become more susceptible to diseases. And we also know that animal disease can suppress productivity and then uh, more animals are required, which produce more greenhouse gas emissions, which can accelerate climate change. So climate change, livestock and disease is inextricably linked. Then, of course, there is another topic, which is land degradation. Um, causes for land degradation are among others, deforestation and land conversion, some of which happens to produce new pastures for livestock crop farming and extractable agriculture, and livestock grazing, especially in combination with high animal numbers. And um, this is from a study that we're currently conducting in Western Kenya. This map shows the areas of Kenya that are under hazard for um, 
plant degradation. And everything that's red is under severe or very severe hazard. So you can see that this is really a big topic in Kenya and it's also a topic in many other East African countries. And if you look at the picture on the bottom right, this is a photo taken from Western Kenya. And it shows how a degraded land cannot function properly anymore because you have loss of vegetation cover. So of course this land cannot provide feed, food and fiber anymore, but it also loses its regulation capacity, um, capacity to regulate pests and control diseases or to stabilize soil and control erosion and capacity for water filtration and nutrient cycling. And we've just heard in the previous presentation that we really need a One Health uh, approach here that takes into account human health, animal health, and environmental health. Or if I talk to my students, I like to put this in simpler words, which is healthy soils are required to grow healthy plants, which can lead to healthy animals and in the end, healthy humans. Finally, there's livestock and nutrient cycling. And I would like to give you one example from Kenya that we're working on here. Many of you might know this picture. This, these are some photos of animal enclosures. In Kenya, we call them bomas. They're also referred to as kraals or corals, and they're very common in pastoral systems um, to guard the animals overnight to protect them from, uh, from predators and from thieves. But this has consequences for nutrient cycling, meaning that it can lead to a nutrient redistribution across the landscape. Inside the BOMAS, there is a high uh, concentration of nutrients, such as nitrogen, due to acu uh, manure accumulation, which can lead to a lot of adverse environmental consequences. For example, 10% of nitrous oxide emissions in Africa originate from BOMAS. And BOMAS are also sources for pollutants that can have adverse health effects, such as air and groundwater pollutants. On the other hand, this nitrogen that is concentrated in the BOMAS is then lacking somewhere else. Um, it can lead to low forage quality if the pasture soils are depleted uh, in nitrogen. And over the long term, uh, this soil nutrient mining can lead to loss of soil organic matter, resulting in additional greenhouse gas emissions and soil erosion. And this is an example for a grassland, but you can have a similar si uh, situation in mixed crop livestock systems as well, especially if farmers do not use enough fertilizer or do not recycle manure then you have continuous nutrient mining from the crop fields, which can lead to uh, soil degradation. And in the long term, this becomes unsustainable, especially with the increasing animal numbers and limited land availability due to land fragmentation. This means that agroecosystems become destabilized in the long run and they're more susceptible to disturbance, for example, pandemics, but also uh, locust outbreak as we have just witnessed or extreme climatic events. And therefore we really need a circular economy and a holistic approach because the more, um, the better the systems work and the more we can avoid leakages, the more efficient these systems will run, which also means that there is less land required and uh, thus a lower probability of pandemics when livestock don't come in touch with, with wildlife. And there are many few extra data for Africa especially regarding environmental pollution. And now I would like to give you some examples on what we do looking at the environmental effects of COVID-19. One study that we're currently conducting is looking at the impact of the lockdown on livestock greenhouse gas emissions from pastoralist systems in Samburu, northern Kenya. We know that the lockdown has reduced the movement of herders with their animals. And we're now looking whether it also has an effect on herd size, animal numbers, and um, feed availability. And we have developed different scenario combinations and are working with survey data of key stakeholders to look at the impact of this lockdown on absolute greenhouse gas emissions, as well as emission intensities which are the emissions per unit of product. And there is also a poster for this study. Uh, so if you want to uh, learn more about it, you can have a look at the share fair later on. And then secondly, 
we have um, we're looking at the medium term impact of the pandemic of on greenhouse gas emissions from livestock and manure in Uganda, Kenya and Ethiopia. We have a, a project going on which is called Program for Climate Smart Livestock and um, one of the things that we're working on are emissions from animals and manure directly and we work with animal activity data and surveys and this project started in the end of 2018 and it is still continuing so we have been lucky to send some people back to the field to collect more data and COVID-19 of course was not planned but it is a natural experiment so we will certainly also see an effect on the greenhouse gas emissions here. And with this I'm coming um, to the end of my presentation. Um, some closing remarks. Um, we know that COVID-19 will impact um, on the relationship of livestock with climate and natural resources, but we still know very little about how what these impacts will look like. And we have some studies underway giving us information on impacts on greenhouse gas emissions, but there are certainly more areas that need, um, need more research. And um, I might be preaching to the choir here, but uh, this is a little cartoon to put things a little bit into perspective. Of course, it is very critical that we address COVID-19 to um, alleviate the immediate threat to people and also cope with the mid and long-term effects. But of course, we cannot forget about the threat of climate change. And I like to quote Markert and Rosenblum here who say that unlike the pandemic, climate change threatens the very basis for continued human prosperity and requires an equal, if not greater, societal mobilization. And um, of course, it's our duty to, uh, to find ways how to make livestock more sustainable and how to really include the environment in the One Health approach. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia, for this uh, very detailed presentation on the, the impact of uh, livestock to climate change, the uh, effect of climate change on uh, livestock, the relationship with uh, land degradation and nutrient recycling. And as you clearly put it, as why we know the uh, effects of climate change on livestock before the pandemic, it is too early to say what would be the, the, the effect post COVID-19. And this require that as a group, as a multi-stakeholder um, uh, partners, we start thinking of how do we assess these various effects post COVID-19, because this will be crucial to formulate necessary policies and actions that would mitigate this effect. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are at the end of uh, our presentations. Unfortunately, we will not have time for questions and answers, please, but you have sent questions on the chat. Mary is assisting in collecting the questions. These will be given to the presenters and the answers will be shared with you uh, during this meeting. So please, you can continue to send your questions and these questions will be shared with the presenters and the answers will be sent back to you. So with this, I would like you to join me in thanking all our five uh, presenters for this magnificent work. And I want to end here and hand over the floor to uh, Cynthia. Cynthia? Hi. It's to me to say hi. Thank you. Can you hear me? Please confirm. Yes, we can hear you, Tessai. Okay, thank you so much, Simplis. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank all the presenters for their very interesting presentation. It's actually framed down the group discussion we'll, ha we'll have now. So shortly we'll be in different working groups to discuss the impact of the pandemic on the livestock sector in Africa. This is a moment for us to reflect and share our experience and what we feel around this issue. So we'll do this group by specific or global uh, uh, gazelle domains, which is about food and nutrition security, livelihoods and income growth, 
animal and welfare, climate and natural resource use. Under each specific domain, we'll have three different questions to address, which are which positive or negative impacts of the pandemic are most significant for the livestock sector in Africa? How are we observing or measuring these impacts? What are the three hidden or overlooked opportunities the pandemic offered to the livestock sector? Okay. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your group discussions. So it's time also to quickly get your reflection. So as we have been introducing a lot, the chat function, this is time for us to use it. Uh, we have two questions for you. Let me go to the first one and then you give me your response. So the instruction here is, I read you the question. You just give your instant response in your chat box, but you don't press it until I come and say go. So please, the question is already projected on the screen as you can see. What is the most interesting or key message about the pandemic and livestock in Africa that you take from this session, the discussion from the discussion you had? This is a question. Please do your instant response with 30 seconds and I will tell you go and you press enter. So we see your response in the chat box. Are we ready? One, two, three, go. Enter your message, please. Oh, it's coming like a storm. Good. You want me to help you? So what I'm seeing, um, so I yes. points. The, the positives and the negatives, the mix of opportunities. So people have been focusing on the challenges, but there's also some big positives in here. We're seeing One Health approach coming up. Mm -hmm. One Health, One Health, that's popping up in many, many times, yeah? Okay. Yeah, that's Good. Key, as a key message. I assume that's a positive and not a negative. The new opportunities. Organization um, we're seeing, the gender elements are coming up. We don't know the details of that. Loss of revenue, um, the unity of purpose. So it's quite a mix. What we're seeing here is quite a lot of positives. Digitalization again, supply of livestock. I don't know whether that means more supply of less supply. Um, the resilience, business opportunities, animal feed security, a very broad range of things here. But there's a mix of negatives and positives, but a lot of positives. A lot of positives. So maybe that's a good, a good word to finish this. Okay, thank you, Peter. Can we move mm -hmm. to the next slide, please? And then we'll handle the second one. Thank you so much, Peter. Stay with me for the second one mm -hmm. as well. Let's move. Uh, this is the second question. Would you follow the same format? So what critical issue did you note here about the pandemic and livestock in Africa? I give a 30 second here again. And then when I say go, you press enter. Hold it now. One, two, three, go. Mm -hmm. We didn't hear about politics. We didn't hear about market closures. We didn't hear enough about academic, economic impact, climate change unpreparedness, gender disaggregation. We didn't hear enough about gender, Mary, thank you. Yeah, loss of jobs, the pastoralism dimensions, okay. Politics, we didn't hear much about politics, welfare, gender, politics, transparency. So again, a very broad range of things we did not hear enough about or even about at all, yeah. Food safety. Okay. Didn't hear about that. Um, there's a lot of points. Um, these are some of the points. So hi, I think there's more coming. Okay. Soon. okay, so let's stop it here then, Michael. Um, yeah. Peter. I think yeah. so. That's good. Thank you so much, Peter, and all the participants. Still, you can continue uh, chatting about your response. Uh, but now, let me hand over to my colleague uh, Mireille to take us through. 
the next session. Ray is the communication manager at the livestock and uh, program in Ilri. So Mire, over to you. Hi everyone. Thank you, Sahai. Um, hi everyone. Um, you would have seen me on the chat and my dogs are making a lot of noise. Just a second. Okay, um, thanks. So we just wanted to introduce the virtual share fair. If you had, obviously, as you had registered in, um, um, to, us, to attend this meeting, you would have received an email inviting, your, inviting you to submit um, your submissions to, you know, on, on what, you, what innovations and solutions you have been producing in your own work um, to help build back better from the COVID-19 pandemic. So we thank everyone for the submissions. We got 18, uh, which is a mix of posters and videos. And they were all under the theme of either in any of the themes of animal health and animal welfare, climate and resource use, food and nutrition security, livelihoods and economic growth. Michael, did you want to share the screen so they show us um, what we have so far? Um, we, we hope that this will inspire you to take a look at what we have so far. Um, which is a great selection from different partners, different people who are doing great work on how, um, on solutions to basically do better um, and build back better from COVID-19. Um, I also want to let you know that um, Livestock Data for Decisions, who is participating in, um, in the meetings, they're going to be compiling these solutions into an interactive dashboard of initiatives and tools to aid coordinated responses to COVID-19 in the Livestock Center. They're going to share that with us in the same way that we'll be sharing information with you, the slides and the Q and A's. Um, so look out for those, okay? So this is gonna stay up for a while. So we uh, encourage you to submit your initiatives to the Share Fair. Um, we'd love to see your work featured because this is really part of, this, um, of us working together to compile solutions because um, I don't think any one country can do this alone. And as we, as, as um, Dr. Doc had said earlier that, you know, this, there are no borders. Uh, COVID-19 knows no borders. So we have to do this together. So um, please do visit the virtual share fair. I'm going to share the link right now in the chat. Maria, um, just to, to add on, so do you want to just explain what we have in each, like kind of in the, in the, in the booth for each of the posters? Sure. Um, so for, as you see, this, this one example that we have from Kuku Nyumbani, um, we have um, an ex uh, example of the, the work that they're doing and the kind of the extension and network that they've produced to, to try to support um, suppliers and the, and the supply chain. So you'll have the poster there. You have a description of what the poster is about. You have a, any useful links that um, relate to the poster. And there was a comment section. So if you want to ask questions, reach out to, to the authors. This is where you have a chance to, to actually do that. Okay, so I think that's it. I don't want to keep anyone any longer. Everyone's been great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. We have come to the end of our first session. Thank you to all the country people who contributed to the different uh, activities. Then we had the introductions. We also had the framing uh, pandemic presentations around the four domains. We further reflected on all this in the groups. And uh, Mireille has uh, invited and reminded us that we now have a share fair. It's time to take a break, but during that break, please visit this wonderful work that is being presented in the share fair. And let's all be ready again to meet at 5.30 p.m. East Africa time for the beginning of uh, the next session. So please stay tuned in, visit the share fair, take a short uh, coffee tea break, and let's meet again.